Oh, going somewhere. Yeah, I like that. It's like on the road with Dan Green. Yeah, that could be like a bumper sticker. Either that or a, I guess. Or a Beat Generation book. Well, it should be like on the front bumper is the first part and then the last part's on the back. Oh. But also, I like I like books. Oh, that could books be like good. some new merch we have on our tables. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all, it's all about the merch. <laughs> um it should be a song you write. It should be an Eric. Oh, my goodness, Eric Stewart fan a, a rock opera. We've we've uh, look at us. Okay, all right. Sorry. Now you, you started. If only it. we knew people who have musical background experience. Oh wait, we do. Jamie. Yes. <laughs> yes. We're ri- Jamie could cast it for yes, us. Yes. Right. <laughs> all right. Well, let's get to this conversation. Yeah. Welcome to the heart of the cards. A conversation about creativity, inspiration, and dealing with what we're dealt. Hey, this is Dan Green. And Eric Stewart. And we are back with Jamie McGonigal for part two of episode 21 of The Heart of the Cards. Welcome back, Jamie. So, where were we? Hmm. I think... <laughs> we talked a lot about uh, some, some background stuff so people get a sense of where what your upbringing was. And, we, you know, we asked some of those Joseph Campbell questions of the hero's journey, you know, what, what was your call to adventure and so forth. Another one of those steps in the journey is the road of trials which deals with, you know, whatever it is that you're pursuing, you're going to encounter some obstacles, some of them uh, specific to what it is you're pursuing, some of them specific to who you are, um, and, and all points in between. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit, whatever you feel comfortable sharing about that. Um, and then definitely let's get into um, the, the other part of the hero's journey, like when, when you attain the goal. You're, <laughs> uh, and oh, there's another cool step called apotheosis where you feel like you're at the height of your of who you are meant to be. Mm. So I, I, I love to play with any of those ideas in whatever order you want to address them. Ooh, I love that. Um, let's see. Where do we go from here? Um, trials, <laughs> I guess. Sure. This uh, is trials. Yeah. We've we all had them. I'm, I'm down, down for some trials. Um, <laughs> let's see. Trials. Uh, I mean, when I uh, was in New York and still, still, voice acting not quite full-time but a lot of the time uh-huh um yeah. i loved it it was wonderful i also had a full-time job uh because voice acting right. doesn't always pay all your bills uh and i uh, one of the things that i was doing on the side i would produce these broadway concerts and events and i did more than 100 of them in new york while i was there uh i'd, I'd find wow I'd come let up me with just some... say let me just say wow just that's, <laughs> that's a lot it was that's a lot it was it was a lot of fun um it was kind of what I was known for in the theater community. Uh, uh-huh. So I'd, I'd come up with some theme. Uh, so I, I would either do like a one night concert of a big Broadway musical. Uh, and I did that for about five years. I did. Um, I would do these shows at, <laughs> at Joe's Pub where I'd say, hey, I'm going to do a concert. Oh, I know Joe's Pub. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, because my wife used to sing there. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah. yeah, they, uh, and they were always amenable cause they would knew, they knew my concerts would sell out. So they'd be like, Hey, why don't you do another concert? Right. Um, so I would right. do these like flops and cuts. Restock concerts. the bar. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I would do these like flops and cuts concerts. So it was all songs that were f- from flop musicals or songs that were cut from musicals. We know <laughs> I do these like right. Broadway, Broadway. Well, cause Joe's the... pub, they would do those themed kind of things. Yes, exactly. Right. So I do like Broadway loves the eighties or Broadway loves country, which it doesn't, yeah, but yeah. Uh, they do sometimes. Um, but uh, all these Broadway stars singing songs uh, and they, it was always a blast. Um, and then someone I had worked on one of these big concerts with uh, invited me to go to the UN. Uh, and I was introduced to all the people at the UN, UN association. Uh, and someone there wow. asked me to go to Africa uh, and help run their hero program, uh, aptly titled for this conversation. Uh, but they basically were bringing, wow. uh, American teenagers over to, uh, very rural, uh, parts of Namibia and South Africa, uh, to help okay. with, uh, AIDS affected communities out there and their educational programs. Uh, because a lot of the, okay. Okay. basically in these, these communities, um, they, these kids would stop the girls specifically would stop going to school when, uh, they hit puberty. Uh, so one of the things we did was basically wow. install bathrooms in all the schools. So, uh, and, and we, you know, right. supplied things for, for young women. Um, and that I came back from that and I kind of saw the world with new eyes. Uh, and I was like, okay, I, I need to imagine. be doing something else. Um, and I loved theater. <laughs> I still love performing. 
I, uh, but I, I was kind of stuck at this crossroads and like, what do I do now? So I started speaking out. So about, roughly, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. Rough, just roughly what age are you at around there? This is, oh, uh, this is 30, 20, 20, no, 27, 28 around there. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I started getting involved in politics. Uh, uh, Prop 8 had just happened in California where uh, they had passed a ban on, <laughs> on gay people being able to marry. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And it started a blog and all this stuff. And I, I realized I had a voice that I could be using for good things. Um, and uh, right. uh, I was putting together a rally to help fight Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which was a military policy, uh, an anti-gay military policy. Right. Um, and I was I moved, came down to D.C. to put together a rally at the White House. And the night before, I was handing out flyers at gay bars, inviting people to come to this rally. And this guy comes up to me and he said, you're not from here, are you? And I said, how can you tell? And he said, you're carrying a big gay metro D.C. map. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> it had little rainbow flags over all the gay bars. Uh, and uh, he spent the rest of the night handing out flyers with me. And uh, flash, flash forward now... 13 years and we're married and have a kid and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that trial was, you know, do I leave New York? Um, right, do right. I leave all this, the, the thing that I do know, uh, all the things that I do know. And um, we, I made a deal with him at the time. We dated long distance for a year. And I said, Hey, uh, if you got a, we were both looking to switch careers into, uh, into activism. Um, and okay. I, he, we said, okay, if he gets a job down there, then uh, we'll move down there. And if he gets a job in New York, I'll stay there and he'll come with, come to me. So he got a job working for the, at the time, the Family Equality Council. Uh, and so I moved down here and it was pretty wild. And I didn't know anyone except for him, basically, when I got down here. Uh, and making friends. That's amazing. An, so making friends oh, as an adult if I just, is if really I just hard. Could, if I, <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, and, pe- and people often take those kinds of things for granted, but no. Um, but so you had such a reaction to going to Africa that it made you rethink the priorities of the way you were living your life, what you were spending your time doing, what you were waking up for in the morning. Yes, 100%. It, it, it had to be more meaningful than than what you had previously been doing. Yes. Which is not to say that that wasn't great for what it was, but mm-hmm. you recognized you wanted something more. Yes, Kind of like the Little Mermaid, and I'm also going to throw in the fact that um, their <laughs> I say that with love their their wedding their wedding pictures their wedding outfits are fantastic. <laughs> they are I don't doubt it fantastic. Uh. When I saw that when I saw those pictures, I'm like, I love these guys. They I mean, but they both have kilts on. They both they both have kilts. It's yes. It's. It's a stereotype, but, you know, gay men, they know how to dress. <laughs> well, eh, not always. Um, so funny story about those. Yeah, that's, uh, true. Is we were, um, Sean knew I was going to be wearing a kilt. We both had suits. We both mm-hmm. had, you know, the suits, the matching suits we ordered. And I said, well, I'm going to be wearing my kilt for, for the wedding. And this is on the drive to Provincetown, you know, a week before we were getting married. Uh, and he said, so you're going to you're gonna wear your kilt just to the the reception right and i was like no i'm wearing it for the whole thing (laughs) and he uh he had like a big moment about this he was uh, and he didn't quite understand why but he was having big feelings about this um and uh, the challenge was that he wanted us to be dressed the same he didn't Mm -hmm. want us to be wearing two different things um but he never Uh. really verbalized that so we get to provincetown and he immediately unbeknownst to me uh, finds a kilt rental company who will as deliver one does. to Robin, as one does, as one does <laughs> um, to deliver. Well, it is P Town. To... Come on, we're talking about P Town. I mean, the fact that you'd you, be surprised. You... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to get anything delivered within a week to P Town is very hard because it's the very tippy tippy end. Oh, I know, me. I know. <laughs> uh, so he managed it, and I had no idea, and he walked out. Oh my God. Onto the beach with me, and he was wearing a kilt, and I lost it. It was, uh, it was, uh, yeah, no, it was, it was pretty magical. It was, so, it awesome. was really, it was really, uh, special. I mean, I remember uh, the first time I saw the pictures, and I thought, um, the, the first of all, you guys are adorable together, but I just thought, that's just <laughs> sweet. It's just a sweet thing. Um, you know, I'm all about those kinds of uh, magical memories. Um, you know, obviously, he loves you. 
He wanted this to be, a, you know, the, the fact that you he wanted you guys to be dressed the same or, you know, uh, <laughs> right. I, that's just right. a, that's very sweet that that that's what. But, yeah, I mean, if you if you haven't seen those photos yet, people, you need to. They're, they're, <laughs> they're adorable. Anyway. We well, fun. and it's and it's it's weird to think that that was not legal for uh, up until relatively recently. Yeah. Uh, well, we were we had organized the rallies. Um Outside the Supreme Court, uh, Sean mm-hmm. and I were basically in charge of a lot of that. Uh, that happened when they were um, when they were arguing uh, uh, mm. the marriage equality uh, yep. the, uh, lawsuits, um, and that we had the, the uh, rallies were in March, uh, and we got married in May, and then it was uh, June that they decided. Uh, so technically, when we got married, it was not legal in every state. Uh, but a few months later right, it right. was, and we went to the white house when it was all lit up rainbow. We were the mm-hmm. first ones there. It was great. Um, but yeah, it's a, and we it was were the first was, ones there. Wow. Yeah, it was, um, and it was 10 years ago, 10 years ago this month, uh, the next month was our wedding. Yeah. I remember, Good Lord. I remember, I, so I was in Australia doing supernova. And I was in the green room and we were all, it was a sort of like playing cards against humanity. And we were doing some, you know, with, with the, with the other guests. And at that time, there was a lot of really sort of bad press in, for, for America. And, you know, I was getting a lot of flack um, from the other, you know, they were needling me about, you know, we couldn't, you know, what's going on over there. What's, and, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then a message pops up Crikey. on my phone that gay marriage is legal in in America. And I went, excuse me, everyone here, but who just beat you to that? And they were like, what? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, right now. I remember that moment. I was like, I need to get a little bit of like, um, like uh, America's got some good stuff going, you know? And I was like, and at first I I was like, this is not real. This can't, this, this can't be. I mean, it's what I want. But it it can't be. And then when I saw that, I was like, "All right, I, you know, I I am a I am a proud American." <laughs> so anyway, that was and uh, here we are, ten yeah. years later, and Republicans are trying to roll that all back. So here we are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the so, fight's never over. <laughs> no, it's it it's never it, it is never over. Um, you know, I just you just let people just be you know who they are and 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 love. You know, love is cool. I just it doesn't need to it doesn't need to have these crazy <laughs> rules. Um, so yeah. so right, and somebody else's love does not define yours. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, and important. how long have you guys what been together? Thirteen years. Yeah. Thirteen um, years. Married. Yeah. Married ten next month. I uh, know it's too bad you guys can't stay in a monogamous, solid relationship. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I remember talking to my dad at one point and he was talking about voting uh, for someone who was anti gay marriage. And I was like, Dad, that's I don't understand why you're so against this. And uh, he said, well, you know, I've just always believed in the sanctity of marriage. And I said, Dad. (laughs) Yeah. You've been married and divorced three times. There you go. <laughs> your fourth wife. <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, uh, yeah. You know. Anyway. Uh-huh. Um, well. So, 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 you both are now working in uh, in activism. Is that what you're doing? Like, what what is a what is a day like in the, in in your household and, and in, in your world? Well, we both uh, thankfully work from home, um, mm-hmm. and and I have for a long time, for almost well, almost eight nine years now. Um, but uh, yeah, I work for the two different companies. Uh, one is called Impactive, uh, which is a a tool for uh, uh, outreach, uh, texting, and phone banking for uh, progressive and democratic organizations and mm-hmm. candidates. Uh, and the other one is KNP, so I train people on how to how to tell their stories effectively uh, yeah. through KNP. So and do you Sean do most of your training? What I want to ask you about the training. Do you do most of your, so oh. you do your training online? You don't, you're not in-person training? Well, I've only been with them since uh, the start of the year. And I did, I've only done one training with them. Uh, it's not the kind of thing that we do, you know, weekly or, or even right. monthly necessarily. Uh, so I've done, I did one training last month that was uh, in person. Um, oh, great. great. And that was great. Yeah. Okay. And you were saying what Sean does, your husband? Oh, Sean's a consultant. He also, he does uh, digital work for progressive organizations. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. That's awesome. Do you find that in this heightened atmosphere of, well, fear and anger, that 
it, how does that affect the way you do your work or, or do you see an effect? Um, great question. Uh, it, it makes the work more, uh, important, honestly. Um, because I think, you know, we hit, we hit the marriage equality thing 10 years ago. And I think a lot of people and a lot of activists, especially a lot of, uh, white gay male activists, uh, decided, okay, well, we're done now. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, <laughs> you know, you yeah. you forget that we still have just like we know, had a black president. I mean, it's all good, right? Yeah, we're great. We're great. Um, and then and then you know, uh, ten years later, you have a uh, young black man knocking on the wrong door and getting mm -hmm. getting shot for it. You know, good uh, unarmed good black Lord. kids left and right. I'm terrified. I have a young black you Latino kid, and right. every time yeah. this happens, this hits home really hard, and I. Uh, I know I can't, but I want to lock my kid in my house and never let him leave. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't of want course. to let him go to of school because I don't know what's going to happen at school. Right. Um, this is this is something that affects all of us. Uh, you know, whether it be school shootings, whether it be uh, you know young unarmed black men getting killed uh, by police officers. You know, the people that that are supposed to be protecting us. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's I I wake up every day and wonder when is my kid going to become a threat. Right. He's a right, right, right. He's a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful little boy. Uh, when does that change? When does that shift? And he becomes someone to be scared of. I, right. Uh, that that's terrifying to me. Mm -hmm. um, so, right. Well, and of course, he doesn't change. It's it's the someone. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, um, yeah all the activism becomes more and more important with every passing day uh, because there's yeah. there's, uh, I think, the previous president emboldened. Uh, a uh, very visceral anger and fear in a lot of people out there who thought that other people having something meant they had less, mm -hmm. uh, mm. and um, and that's that's terrifying to me. Uh, so people feel they have to protect what they have and that they should have more and other people should have less. I think the the um, the smartest thing that the right wing has ever done is. Uh, convinced uh convinced so many of their followers that their um <laughs> that them having uh that, that poorer people were the enemy that people who had less uh, were the problem and not the you know the people who are making billions uh and the people who are in charge of everything you know mm -hmm. um but yeah it's it's all it's a terrifying world we live in right now um so uh, that's not gonna change uh, but I can work and do what I can to at least make things safer for me and my family and families like mine. Yes. Well, you're also, you're also a, um, a smart, um, person who is empathetic, who is, um, looking for ways to help beyond what, you know, the people they know you, you're, you're, you're the way where you grew up, like you said, um, the the fact that you um you know you were talking about the church and ha that you grew up in and how they there was there was uh it was inclusive and open minded and that's great but you also did come from a community that might not have been as diverse and open minded just mm -hmm. in general um right. but your personal um journey the the way that you are paying attention to uh, taking those blinders off and paying attention to the world around you um is is also inspiring. Um, I've made a point that to me there are sort of two types of, of of bigotry and racism, right? There's there's the ignorant who have never been exposed to people that are different than they are, and when they are, they might have a chance to realize that we have a lot of things in common, and that maybe hatred is a bad thing. And then there's the people that uh, even when they are exposed to it, still decide that they're going to hate, right? So the ones that are ignorant you feel like there's a second chance. There's like, maybe there's, mm -hmm. you know, there, but the way you are approaching your um, journey and your mission is the being inclusive is, is also something that I think is uh, what makes you special as a person. That's unique to Jamie. Um, you are not a ranting, angry person, unless you need to be. Um, <laughs> I but, have my you, moments. <laughs> but, but, there's a there's it, 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 from what I've read when you when you posted or what I've heard, um, you still come from a place of respect 
you you know, the minute we go, we go low, we lose the argument, right? When you start getting ugly like that, you lose the argument. You're not even, you're not even getting the point across. And I'm, I, I commend you on both your, uh, the platform that you've chosen. Um, but I also think that platform has chosen you. I think that you are a great voice of reason to also be inclusive and give people the rights that they deserve. Thank you. I, I appreciate that more than I can say. Um, it's really kind of you to say that. Um, and, and yes, I think there's uh, if there's an element that's chosen me, there's an element that I've chosen. And uh, it can be scary for people talking about, you know, folks who uh, who are just ignorant uh, that, that haven't had access to people who are different from them. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there's it's really difficult to explain something like privilege to a poor person mm-hmm. um, or someone who's not as well off. Um, uh, and. And there's a natural defensiveness that happens in us, I think, when we are told that there are people who have less than us. And I don't know why. I don't quite understand that. But I've had it too. I mean, I have uh, I remember doing trainings uh, or being part of trainings uh, on privilege specifically and on uh, whether it be racial or, or economic or otherwise mm-hmm. um, or, or gender-wise. Uh, and... Uh, it wasn't until someone said to me uh, or, or made it clear to me that it was uh, that, that we all have different privileges uh, and we also lack different privileges uh, and that I was able to acknowledge the fact that I grew up super poor. We went to food banks. We My, my family was foreclosed on when I was 12 years old mm. um, and wow. we went to living in apartments and, and there were times when we very much feared homelessness. Um, uh, but no one has ever walked on the other side of the street because right, right. of the color of my skin. Right. No one has ever been terrified of me simply because of how I look. Mm-hmm. No one has ever paid me less money because of my gender. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's there. It's not that there that anyone is less than or more than me and what I what I've experienced. Uh, it's not, we, in the movement, in the, the progressive movement, we, we call this, um, uh, what is it? Uh, Privilege Olympics, something like that. So it's not, it's not a game. No, you don't <laughs> <Right>. win <laughs> by right. having the most or the, the least privileges. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's about recognizing where you are and how you can help people who have fewer privileges than you do. So with all of that, have you ever thought about politics? Running for office? Oh no, I would never. No, I have no <laughs> desire. I have, I, I, I have <laughs> zero desire. Um, I can make more change doing what I'm doing and being where I'm at. Right. Um, I, I uh, can support politicians that are doing good things. Right. Um, uh, and I also I like making making change locally. Uh, mm-hmm. I've I've worked on presidential campaigns. I've worked on you know, Senate and even statewide campaigns here and there. Uh, right. But I think I think I can make more of a difference in my own community. And that's honestly where you're going to see the biggest difference in your everyday lives. Sure. Right. Um, who is in the White House? You're you're I know everyone cares a lot about it and it's important. Um, but that's that has nothing to do with, you know, what books are being banned in your school library. Right. 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 Uh, right. That has to do with your school board. That has to do with your, your county level or even sometimes state level uh, leadership. So Mm -hmm. if you're doing something, if you, if you have the energy and or you're excited to do something, I'd say do something on the local level because you'll, you'll see, you'll be able to see a a marked difference in, in the results uh, that can come from the work you're doing. I'm glad you mentioned that because one of my things about, and I follow politics pretty intensely. Um, my, my stepfather worked with John Kennedy, like I like involved in politics from the beginning. And I've always, I'm always fascinated by it. It can drive you crazy, but I'm always fascinated by the, the moving parts. But I've also said that the majority of people don't pay attention to their local elections and they don't pay attention to those things until it happens to them. Until right. this stuff actually affects them, 
when we look at the big picture, you could ask most voters in America um, the same question, and then they and would they would not be able to answer it. If you said to them, "Okay, your presidential pick, can you tell me three of their policies that you support?" Right. and they're like, "I I don't know," I like they may, they might know one, right? Um, but until those policies affect them on the local level, they really don't even care. They really right, don't can, care. You can also ask them the same question about their local leaders and say, who's your congressman? Yeah. Who's your city city council person? Right, who's right. your state senator? Right. Ninety percent of them, I don't think, will know. Yeah. And, and voting in midterm elections is very rare. I mean, people are mm-hmm. like, ah, whatever. It doesn't matter. I can't change anything. Or what's it going to matter? Like, it's not the president. And and the fact that you said focus on the on the local on the local level is really important. And, and what happens is it something pops up. It, you know, in your in your state or in your city, and you go, what what just happened? How did this happen? It's like, how did it happen? Because you didn't vote for somebody, or you did vote right. for somebody without even paying attention to what their policies are. So I do get it. I just I feel like you know, the the frustration for me as someone who does follow politics is I really wish I could vote for the smartest person in the room, mm-hmm. and and. <laughs> That's not usually the person that we we get right. elected, and, and 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 where you come from, and I'm not saying like you know I'm going to agree with everything you say, um, but I pretty much would go on a limb and say I probably agree with ninety percent of where you stand on things, um, right. like where you're coming from and your approach to how you present it is the kind of thing that I wish were more options for me as a voter. Well, yeah, it's also where you are geographically, you know, that's, yes, um, yes. I'm, I'm very lucky. I live in a very progressive little city. Um, we were the, the, either the first or second city in the country to allow 16 plus voting in, in local elections. Mm-hmm. Uh, we allow for non-citizen voting in local elections. It's not, they can't, you know, vote for president, uh, cause that's a federal election, but you know, our mayor, our city council people, our school, uh, well, yeah, our mayor and city council people. Uh, and, and local ordinances can be voted on by 16 year olds uh, mm. or people who are not citizens. And I love that. I love that, you know, we're actually, uh, I, I guess, you know, um, walking the walk when it comes to being inclusive. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, in, but why isn't your city burning in flames? I mean, I, I've been surely trying that to must figure have that out. Chaos. I'm trying to figure that out. We also <laughs> strangely have a, a very um, large, uh, Catholic community that that is becoming more and more prevalent in, in local politics uh, and um, trying to uh, do some not so great things in our community uh, that I haven't appreciated. Which, it, which should not be always associated with being Catholic. No, of this course particular not. It's, just, example. it's right, this particular right. church, this particular um, uh, community, because it is a community and they, mm-hmm. they, they call themselves right. a right. Uh, intentional community. Um and so, oh. yeah, it's, it's, I, uh, cause gated was over. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it's, it's frankly, uh, it's frankly a little culty, um, uh, this particular oh, part. Oh um, but, uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's been challenging and there's, you know, it's, it's all these little local, it's the local decisions that really matter. So with, with all of that, because this sounds like, I mean, your your household the, the you know both of you are are so uh, involved in this and the activism where do you find or do you still search for your creative outlet um you started with such an intense uh uh passion for performance and for acting and for musicals and all of this it's who you are right that's in your soul um and this mission is also who you are do you have a balance to find that creative outlet as well? That's actually been really a big challenge for me. Um, I, I miss it. I, I do miss it a lot. It's mm-hmm. something that, you know, in, in DC, in this area, um, there just aren't many opportunities uh, for people who are not doing it as a full-time career. Mm-hmm. Um, there's amazing mm-hmm. theater in DC. There's incredible, incredible performances and productions. Uh, but it requires you to be doing that full time. Right. Um, and so if there was a community theater or something around here, I would love to, to help out. Um, P- 
people have said to me, you know, you know, you've started a lot of big things. Why don't you just start a community theater? And I, it's still, it's, it's there maybe perhaps at some point. Um, uh, I would like to, uh, but it's, it's just hard. Um, and I, as far as, as far as, uh, voice acting, I would love to do more. I just haven't, um, I don't have like a big studio set up in my house, right. uh, or even a little studio set up in my house. Uh, so it just, it makes it hard, uh, you know, I'll send in auditions here and there. Um, but, uh, yeah, not much has happened there. And I've, since I'm not in New York, it's just, it's a little, a little more difficult, a little more right. challenging. So I would like to find those, but, um, they're, they're not there yet. One of those unintended benefits from a pandemic at least in in the voiceover industry, is that it's much much more acceptable now, right. to work from home. Yes, right. So, even with a modest home studio, um, yeah, that's that's more accessible to you than it ever would have been otherwise. Yes. Yeah, but um, but yeah, but obviously, it. you know, that's just one part of. <laughs> yeah, and Jamie, if you ever wanted to, if you ever wanted to set up something at home, uh, inexpensively and um, without being a, a technical um, genius. I'm more than willing to walk you through a basic uh, instructional, um, uh, you know, um, video um, to t- to tell you how to do it, um, <laughs> just so that you at least have that option if it's something that you wanted that. to do. Because, um, you know, you're a talented guy. Um, that's something that you could probably um, fit in around all the other stuff that you're that you're juggling. Uh, if it's something you want to do, um, yes, one hundred percent, I will take you up on that. Yeah, but seriously, I mean, a lot of a lot, that's sort of the thing that can be a little intimidating. I, I've got a couple of friends that I've helped sort of set them up that way um, because they're just like, I'm not technical, I'm not an engineer, I don't know this. And it's like, well, you know what? Uh, or it's too expensive and this and that. Um, for what you would need, we could figure something out and at least hold your hand through that process so that you're like, oh, I'm ready to go. And then uh, and then that could be an option. Then you don't have an excuse of, oh, this opportunity just came up, but I'm not set up for this. Well, now you no, are. Or I'm not in New York. Yeah, no, that would be great. I would, I would very much appreciate that. Let's do that. I actually, I wanted to circle back to something I was thinking as, as you guys were discussing the local level engagement. Mm-hmm. And, you know, most people couldn't name their representatives and um, I'm certainly guilty of that from time to time. Um, and to to speak to this idea that I think there's a lot of anxiety, uh, and this may be particularly for people who are younger, so like great about the 16 plus voting thing. You, you feel anxiety when things are beyond your control, mm-hmm. where you don't know what to do. I mean, whatever the problem is, it's worse if you don't know what to do about it or feel like you're helpless to do anything about it. And I think that's why a lot of people disengage from politics. They feel like whatever effort they make doesn't really matter. Right, right. And as is, and as somebody who's, who's a lot of your efforts are to counteract that, that myth, right? Yeah, yeah. To, to get rid of that, that sense of, of, of apathy. Of, and, and helplessness. I mean, that's, it's, it's. And, and helplessness. Yeah, the helplessness, I think, is the, is the problem. And then the apathy is the the symptom um <laughs> right well said. well said uh and so the, to get rid of that i mean you, people have to see that what they're doing is making a difference so they uh right. voting in a presidential election isn't going to do that it might make you feel really good if the guy you wanted gets elected and i say guy because well they've all been men it's almost always a guy <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah, if if you can get involved locally, you know, go uh, if you yeah. if you know yeah. a neighbor or find someone that you believe in whose policies you believe in, whether it's school committee or or city council or selectmen, whatever you have in your in your town, um, uh, then uh, get involved. Go help. Go. You know, it, right, it can be right. if you have money, make a donation. But you can also go volunteer. You can knock doors. Right. I was knocking right. doors for, <laughs> I, uh, I was also very involved in politics, like not just, it wasn't just theater at a young age. Uh, I was also politics. So my mom had me handing out flyers for Gary Studs uh, when I was, I think, five or six years old in Massachusetts. He was the first openly gay congressman. Uh, and uh, again, this was five or six years old. So it's, it's in my blood. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then in high school, I went sending putting out uh, flyers for Bill Clinton 
in Massachusetts, which mm-hmm. <laughs> I think he won like 94% or something. Um, uh, so, but I, I felt like I was making a difference and feeling like I was participating in it. So, you know, you can sit and complain about it's things. a healthy. Yeah, it's a healthy behavior. It's right. a healthy way to relate. Right. So you can you can sit and, and be upset about the way things are or you can, you know, right. get off your butt and do something was, about it if you can. I was just going to I was just going to get into that. I used to complain. Now I vote. Right. But this even goes beyond the politics. This goes to what Jamie was saying before. It's like y- you can either, uh, you know, go after the things you you are passionate about. If it's something that you have to do, then you do it. Um, right. This goes with everything. This goes with the creativity. This goes with, sure. you know, yeah. you, you need to do something. Um if you just sit back, wait for the phone to ring, or you're like, yeah, my vote, you know, my vote's not going to make a difference, or whatever it may be, not specific to politics, but just anything. If you want to make a change with your life, or you want to make, you know, you still have to attempt it, right? You mm-hmm. still have to make an, an effort to try to do that, or else you don't know what's going to to happen. So I think that that's part of your, that's in your DNA, Jamie. Is that from from your I need to do this with my creative journey. I need to do this with my activism journey. I need to do this as a parent. I need to do these things because you're not one. Even if you are working from home, you're not sitting on your butt doing nothing. Right, right, right. It reminds me of the great uh, quote from Abraham Lincoln. The best way to predict your future is to create it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So speaking of that, this is what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. What, what, what is your, like, do you have another goal what is your what is the future what is the next if do do you have a next chapter that you are writing um i don't i don't i have i mean i i we <laughs> there's nothing i can point to and say oh that's the next thing i'm doing um my life has always been my when when i was a kid my mom would go buy paper plates at the supermarket and we had this gold shag carpet because <laughs> it was the 70s and 80s yeah uh and this first floor that you could just go from room to room to room in a circle I would drop the paper plates for some reason uh, and pretend that the floor was lava because that's what every child does. Oh, yes. And I would jump on the next paper plate. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, my mom would, of course, be upset that I, you know, destroyed all the paper plates. But um, I I use that as kind of an analogy for my life. Like I I I throw the paper plate. I see what happens next. I've been all over the place. I've done a lot more than I ever, ever, ever imagined I would do at the age that I'm at. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll see what's next. I've, I've thought about a lot of things. We'll we'll see what the next chapter holds. Awesome. She may have been upset about those paper plates, but <laughs> she also never had to take you to the emergency room for burnt legs. That's right. True. So true. So true. No. But some no. but some serious rug burn, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great that's a great visual. I love it, Jamie. I love, I love that it. idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I think we've had a good healthy conversation here. Yes. And again, thank you so much for your time, Jamie. It's been a pleasure to catch up with yes. you. Yes. You too. I hope we can do it in person sometime soon. Yes. That would be awesome. And Eric, uh as always, a pleasure engaging in these conversations with you. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. This was fun. <laughs> as always. And a very big thanks to everyone else who's listening to this conversation. We really appreciate all the things that you say uh, in in our comments below. And when we have a chance to interact person to person at a convention or whatever, um, thank you for all of those kind words. And um, I, I, I can't express how grateful I am to be able not only to speak to, to Jamie and to Eric, but uh, to speak within a community um, who is as welcoming and uh, embracing these ideas and, and people um, as, as this community is. So thanks for that. And we will look forward to the next time that we can share a conversation about creativity, inspiration, and dealing with what you're dealt. On the Heart of the Cards. Thanks for listening to The Heart of the Cards with Dan Green and Eric Stewart. We hope this conversation in some way spoke to you. Whatever your journey, we look forward to crossing paths again in the next episode. This is Veronica Taylor, and on behalf of Adromeda Productions, we wish you well. Adromeda, always a sound choice. <laughs>